This is Jesse Zerowell and Perspective on today's News Talk TNT Radio. Welcome to Perspective. I am your host for the hour, Jesse Zerowell. And I am happy to say that joining me today is somebody I consider a good friend and a colleague. And she is Syria-based independent journalist, Vanessa Bealey. Vanessa, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, hi, Jesse. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. So I invited you on to speak about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and some mm-hmm. parallels, some very obvious parallels I see there uh, with what's happened in Syria over the past 10 or 11 years. But obviously there are a lot of other things we can get into as well because the news is coming in by the minute, if not the second. And it's hard to know where to start with these conversations. But (laughs) just before we jumped on, Mm. I don't know if you were listening to the news updates, but the British embassy is... (laughs) Not only encouraging, but facilitating mercenaries, essentially, (laughs) to travel to Ukraine and fight Mm. for its so-called freedom and democracy. In all of your time Mm. reporting, have you ever encountered anything like this? Um, On one hand, no. I was just thinking about this before I came on. on one hand, no, but I think all that we're actually seeing is it, it's now very brazen and very transparent because, of course, you know, the entire U.S. coalition, which included uh, Britain, encouraged extremist fighters that had been radicalized on their own territories or on uh, territories they had already um, colonized or near colonized, like Iraq, for example. Um, encouraging them or or training them and equipping them to uh, invade Syria. Um, So they were also effectively uh, mercenaries and rebranded as, you know, uh, the moderate rebel inside Syria. Uh, Right. So again, bringing... um, so we, you know, we are seeing the same pattern of events. It's just now they can kind of, it's a bit like with um, the extreme measures under the COVID project. Now they can get away with it. Do you know what I mean? Because now the, the enemy is so much bigger and Russia has been the enemy for, for decades. I mean, we talk about the new Cold War, but, but the West now is bringing down the Iron Curtain. It's the Western Iron Curtain uh, on press. freedom on 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 uh, uh, freedom of speech on i mean it's it's a uh, book burning days iron curtain all over again and of course it started it kind of started with syria with the censorship of alternative voices diverging views um the disappearing of syria to be fraudulent then of course we had um covid and and the and the total universal wholesale censorship of scientists uh, epidemiologists doctors medical staff uh, journalists experts <laughs> anyone who was challenging uh the mainstream narratives and of course for me the mainstream narrative is simply an extension of intelligence and security agency narratives right right um, yeah, so are glaring. The thing is now it's almost on on megaphone. <laughs> so I think you know, and the ext- what I what I find utterly extraordinary, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. You know, people are just buying it all over again, and I, yeah. I'm just like. I, I'm a little bit sort of um, dumbstruck by this. I, I don't really Syria or Libya or in Iraq um, or Yemen or Palestine, right? Or Yugoslavia even. 
we're dealing with Russia. Um, and people are jumping on the same war bandwagon, actually with even greater ferocity and savagery, because of course they're being pushed into that by the media or uh, led by the supporting uh, the extreme warmongering by the West. I mean, all of these sanctions that are being introduced are dangerous. <clears throat> well, that's going to bring them in direct confrontation with Russia over Ukraine. <laughs> right. Yes, it seems that not only is this an extension of the globalist COVID-19 agenda, but that the previous iteration of the agenda, which was COVID-19 and all the pseudo pandemic fear mongering that went along with that it seems that that primed everybody who's falling in line behind the war push with russia to do so and we see across the board people both known and unknown coming out on social media with hashtag I stand with Ukraine, with Ukrainian flags in their social media profiles. And mm. at the same time, they have no historical knowledge of the region of Ukrainian mm. and Russian relations. They don't know why people in the DPR and LPR and Crimea want nothing to do with the government in Kiev. And the ahistoricism is frightening, among many other things. And on top of that, what's frightening is to see the way people so robotically react to and comply with what they're told by corporate media, which has spent, mm. let's just take the last two years, never mind before that, but just the last two years doing nothing but lying to them. <laughs> They've lied. You know, this is the extraordinary thing, Jesse. This is where I'm really struggling. They lied over Iraq. They lied over Yugoslavia. They lied over um, Libya. They lied over Syria. They lie over Yemen. Uh, they lie over Palestine. They, they continuously lie. You can pretty much say it's, it's more difficult these days to find an element of truth in mainstream media. You know? And yet, exactly as with COVID, people are assuming the governments that brought them global terrorism, that uh, are, are backing and sponsoring, equipping and arming the terrorist forces inside Syria, um, that have absolutely stripped the working class of any privileges or, or any uh, independence through the COVID project uh, are now suddenly telling you the truth about Russia. Of course they're not. They're absolutely disappearing the entire history of why Russia has reacted in this way. You know, they've been baiting Russia for, for decades, not only uh, with the expansion eastwards of NATO, which from the 1990s, they promised they weren't going to do, but also, Multiple you know, times. inside. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this is, this has been an ongoing, I mean, Russia has been, if, if you flipped uh, the, 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 the coin, and let's say Russia was encamped, or remember the, you know, the Cuban uh, missile uh, drama, <laughs> right. Um, but if you imagine, I wasn't alive Russia, then, but I certainly. Yeah, but I mean, we all kind of know about it, right? Um, and right. if for imagine, if if we imagine Russia is encamped in Mexico and is talking about expanding eastward into uh, territory on the border with America, what would America be doing? You know, and, and people right. are not computing this. They, they've heard for so long successive American presidents talking about threat to national security, etc. And of course, that's what they're now calling Russia, an extraordinary threat to, to national security and economy and etc. etc. From where? Who has their military right. bases? I mean, you know, this is, 
really the people I, I don't understand why people don't at least apply the most basic logic we're not talking about as i said a, you know a syria where, where the blowback is not going to be okay you're going to have terrorist attacks in europe you're potentially going to have terrorist attacks uh, in america we're talking potential nuclear war Mm -hmm. you know? We're talking the shutdown of supply of gas, oil, um, minerals, food, wheat. You know, the, the blowback on Europe, for example, is going to be absolutely massive on, on countries that are already decimated by two years of, of COVID lockdowns and economic depressions and austerity measures, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it's, this is... This is a very dangerous point in, in history, and people are being so cavalier about it. You know, I was listening to that guy talking just before I came on, you know, oh, I'm going to go and defend democracy against autocracy. Mate, you don't know right. what you're talking about, <laughs> you know? I know. But he's going to go and, and get his head blown off. For what? And the same right. thing, I, I don't know what it is with people. Why do they need to go and fight causes somewhere else? It was the same situation in Syria with people going and fighting um, for the Kurds. Why? Because the whole Kurdish separatist uh, concept was sold to them as this kind of anarchist, uh, democratic, right. women's rights, LGBT. You know, it was so PC. And that's exactly why right. it was sold to them. And, I, you know, I know... Like uh, this Rojava utopia. Yeah. You know? And, and people fell for it. I remember giving a talk in Iceland and people were going crazy at me because uh, Icelanders were dying in Afreen. And I kept saying to them, but you realize in Afreen, it's the Turks that are killing you because the Kurds wouldn't allow the Syrian army in to defend them. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. why are you yelling at me? You know, the Syrian army offered to go in and, and actually take care of them, protect them. They refused. And then Turkey ethnically cleansed them. And a number of Icelanders were killed in the process. But, you know, I, I really, I don't know where this desire comes from to go and fight in, in these weird causes that are developed by uh, intelligence agencies, uh, amplified by mainstream media, and uh, whatever regime is in power at that time, it can be Democrat, Republican, it can be we don't really have a Labour or Conservative anymore. They're, you know, we have Blairites and probably less extreme Blairites in the Tory Party. You know, the right wing, whatever that is these days, is actually more reasonable on these issues than the so-called left wing. I mean, we've talked about this regarding COVID. Right. But how can you go and fight something when you really don't understand what you're fighting for? Yeah, I agree. And it's almost as if, or maybe it is the case that this primal urge that some humans seem to have to, uh, that... Sorry, I'm back now. Okay. I was saying it almost seems sorry, that, sorry, that there, there's a primal urge that human beings have, or at least some of us have, that predisposes mm -hmm. us or disposes us toward conflict and it's like we can't help ourselves and as mm -hmm. soon as there's an opportunity we throw ourselves into the breach whether we know what's going on or not and obviously that's not all of us but we're seeing with right we're seeing with these mercenaries and we're not let's not mince words they are mercenaries they're being incentivized to go fight as independent volunteers in a war although i would hesitate to call it a war at this point in a conflict that's not even theirs oh, exactly. that has nothing yeah. to do with them and on top of mm -hmm. that in corporate media mm -hmm. it's being compared as uh, a noble cause as as something akin to the fight against Spanish fascism <laughs> in the 30s and it's mm -hmm. it's utterly yeah. dystopian yeah and actually exactly the same metaphors of course were used uh, in Syria you know uh, Aleppo was the, right. uh, the Guernica 
in Syria, etc. Um, you know, and these are very emotive um, tropes that they're they're rolling out. But the fact is, okay, if you came to fight in Syria, chances are you're fighting uh, alongside the so-called democratic rebels that are fundamentally dominated by Al Qaeda terrorist groups or affiliates, right? In in Ukraine, what you're effectively going to do is to defend the far-right fascist neo-Nazi uh, National Guard, for example, that we've seen videos. Um, of them effectively brutal, brutalizing civilians trying to leave, shooting civilians that are trying to um, move around under the imposed curfews and lockdowns and so on. So these are, generally speaking, thugs. I'm not talking about you know the National Ukrainian Army, many of which, by the way, have, have surrendered as the Russians mm -hmm. have moved forward. But I'm talking about the hardcore um, far-right, fascists and neo-Nazis that have been developed exactly for this conflict since the end of World War II, when America mm -hmm. enabled many of the Ukrainian Nazis to escape. I mean, anyone can go and watch uh, Oliver Stone's movie documentary, which is available on Vimeo for free, um, called uh, Ukraine on Fire. And you right. will discover an awful lot there about how um, this was planned decades ago. Uh, in that, you know, the American collaboration with Nazis post-World War II and weaponization of Nazis against um, Russia was planned for decades by the CIA. I mean, again, watch the Doug Valentine um, videos or read his books on uh, the CIA and on how they've been using uh, the Nazis. And, you know, remembering that in 2012, just as the Arab Spring, was breaking across the Middle East and including in Syria when, um, at the, or rather in 2011, but then in 2012, we started to see, uh, I think it was the f then that the first um, far-right candidate was elected to, to parliament, uh, Ole Tanyabok, I think his name is, I probably right. totally mispronounced it. Um, but the Svoboda party, right? And then we mm -hmm. started to see, so from 2012 onwards, we started to see, of course, the, the, the um, John McCain, um, Victoria Newland, EU, um, or rather actually led by the US, um, support for these far right. I mean, in, in 2012, when the so-called, or, or rather, sorry, in 2014, when the so-called revolution was happening to throw out the democratically elected uh, Yanukovych, President Yanukovych, who, of course, hailed from the eastern provinces, from Donetsk, that uh, Putin has just recognized as independent, which, of course, then precipitated the uh, invasion of right. Ukraine. Um, Yanukovych was basically, you know, he had to, to flee um, after um, a, a Western or a U.S. manufactured coup, actually. It was very uh, U.S. dominated, but let's not forget that Israel was sponsoring this coup. Israel, Israelis in Ukraine were actually um, commanding uh, Ukrainian militia. So Israel is working hand in hand with the fascist neo-Nazi brigades inside Ukraine. And Israel has a very big presence. I think it was more than 30,000 tech service employees were evacuated um, just prior to, to Russia's military action. Right? right. So the Israeli involvement and Israeli intelligence and military have collaborated with Ukraine for decades on promoting an anti-Russia sentiment within Western Ukraine. Okay, and even the Israeli embassy recently has been doing the same thing, calling for mercenaries to go and fight in Ukraine. In fact, even before the British embassy did so, hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm not surprised that Israel would do that, but I didn't know that they were doing that before the British. Yeah. Um, and it right. seems like this has largely been a British project, a sort of city of London project but um <laughs> of course project, yeah. it, right but of course israel is always uh present in these sorts of mm. operations whether explicitly so or sort of as a dark horse um we see well, in actually, syria you, yeah yeah 
Go, I, and go ahead. actually, strangely, sorry, um, I think the week that, uh, yeah, the week that Putin recognized uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, which, by the way, he didn't annex them. He didn't, um, uh, what's the word? He, he, he didn't interfere. What he did was he recognized them. And so that right. means Donetsk and Lugansk, under international law, they have a right to declare themselves as independent. Why? Because they have a military, uh, a recognized military um, independent to them, and they are under severe threat. Um, since right. 2014, they have been shelled and sniped and attacked on a daily basis by um, the Ukrainian fascist brigades. Um, leading to more than uh, 14,000 deaths and countless injuries, right? So, so right. effectively, this is a genocide that has been going on since 2014 that no one is talking about. Right. You know, and all of these people it, it is, like it is a genocide. Ukrainian flag. Yeah. You know, it's recognized as a genocide. They've destroyed infrastructure exactly, you know, as they've, they've done in Syria, um, which, of course, people are, are again ignorant of the fact that the the u.s coalition has carried out effectively a genocide um under article two the the uh, genocide convention article two section e if you destroy civilian infrastructure if you do everything in your power to reduce the ability of a, of a civilian to live a dignified life or you ethnically cleanse um, um sectors or or or, or parts of the fabric of society, which of course they have done. They've driven out Christians, they've driven out or most of the minority uh, sex inside um, Syria, right? It's genocide, the same in Yemen, <laughs> genocide. Yep. The same in Donbass, genocide. And yet that is not spoken about and it was not spoken about between 2014 to now. Right, and I was speaking on a show yesterday with somebody and he was hesitant about calling what's happened to uh, the people who live in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk in the DPR and LPR. He was hesitant about mm. calling what's been happening to them for the past eight years genocide. And I thought it is what's <laughs> happened to them ticks all the boxes and what 14,000 people isn't enough for you it's not a high enough death rate and <laughs> and this is and this was somebody who's uh trying their best to take a critical independent look mm -hmm. at what's happening but still there's mm -hmm. that that reticence to see it for what it actually is and that yeah, seems to and, be and... yeah go ahead no, I, I think it's it's really interesting, and I've made this point elsewhere. It's the use of the word genocide. People people are kind of afraid to use it when it's against the U.S. Uh, coalition alliance, right? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. But how many times have I been called a genocide denier because I'm pushing back against Syria narratives, right? Right. Time, I mean, time and time and time again. And even during the COVID-19 project, uh, which, by the way, has completely disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody's stopping people going out demonstrating on the streets against Russia. It's a bit we're, we're back to the kind of BLM uh, take the knee for Floyd moment. Right. In in the middle of lockdown, suddenly people were back out on the streets because this is this is a it's, it's a it's a. I don't want to say kosher. It's um, it's a uh, halal uh, demonstration, right? Right. Um, and so, uh, uh, slightly lost my other oh, genocide thing. But what was really interesting, I think it was in the first uh, speech that Putin made, just as the invasion had started, or just before it, and he used the word genocide. Now, people need to understand how important this is because Russia in diplomatic circles is uh, they're very patient and they're very measured. You know, they're not like the hysteria that you got from actually even the UK now and, and the US in particular. And 
his using the word genocide, I think it was Andrei, Andrei Martinov, who's a Russian commentator. You can find him on YouTube. He's written a number of books about the collapse of the American um, empire. You should maybe reach out to him, actually. He's based in the U.S., I think. And, okay, uh, great. He talks about the fact, he said, look, this is really important that Putin is using this word genocide in relation to what is going on and in relation to, to the Donbass. And why is it important? Because number one, Putin is an international lawyer. Number two, Russia sits on the UN Security Council. We saw in Syria how important the Russian veto was how important it was for Russia to get involved in the investigation into the white helmets, particularly into the organ trafficking. They brought mm -hmm. it to the UN panels, right? They brought it to the forefront of discussion in uh, the highest level you can get to. The same with the OPCW. If Russia had not been involved, that entire kind of appalling uh, staging of events in Duma 2018 would perhaps not have had the traction it had because Russia was in charge of bringing it again to the attention of the UN, right? So if Putin is talking about genocide, that is something that the West is afraid of because the West has been responsible for genocide in Iraq, genocide in Libya genocide in former Yugoslavia, and I'm not talking about uh, the Srebrenica, okay? Right. Um, genocide in, uh, in Yemen, genocide in Syria. And I'm using the word because that's what it is. As you said, you know, what happened in, in Lugansk and Donetsk, it qualifies for genocide. They were basically attempting to ethnically cleanse the whole area. Why? Because actually when, when Yanukovych came to power, I uh, can't remember which year he was elected, but he was, he was popularly elected. He was democratically elected, if we're talking democracy. Um, and the majority of his votes came from the eastern uh, province, Donbass. And of course, Donbass is um, in Ukraine, probably the breadbasket of Ukraine. Ukraine is the is known as the breadbasket of Europe, but of course, it's also to some extent the breadbasket for Russia, right? because it has massive um, coal deposits, which the majority of which are in the Donbass region. Um, oil, natural resources, hydrocarbons, minerals, gold, um, etc. And wheat, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a very abundant agricultural area. Um, right. So, of course, you know, it, it's, it's extremely attractive to both sides, to be fair. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, I do want to pick up on the genocide mm. point after a short break that we have to throw to mm. right now. Uh, because I think there's a lot to be a lot more to be said about that and a lot more um, parallels we can draw to um, Western empires projects mm -hmm. elsewhere in the world. So more with Vanessa Bealy after the break. Roxanne Watson is on a mission. Hello, how are you doing today? She wants more people to register as organ, eye and tissue donors. Are you an organ donor? Yes, I am. Yay. Yay. My goal is to sign up the most people in the United States. <laughs> what drives her? Roxanne's own life was saved through the gift of a heart transplant, made possible by an organ donor. I decided that day that I was going to devote myself to the cause of organ donation and signing people up and honoring my donor by doing that. Now she's back to health, and she's a powerful force helping to save lives every day through her work. Imagine what you can make possible by leaving behind the gift of life. Eight people can be helped with the major organs, and up to 50 people can be helped with a little bit of everything. And when you think about it that way, that you could help that many people, it's amazing, it really is. Learn more and sign up as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, we'll probably stay together. Probably? <laughs> it's been 23 minutes since I ate. 
I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Perspective with Jesse Zerowell on today's News Talk TNT Radio. Welcome back to Perspective. I am your host for the rest of the hour, Jesse Zerwell. And I've been speaking with friend and colleague and independent Syria-based journalist, Vanessa Bealy, about Ukraine, about Russia, about a lot of parallels to what's been happening in Ukraine with what's happened in countries like Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, Palestine. And just before the break, we were speaking about Putin's use of the term genocide in one of the first major speeches, you could call it, that he gave before um, Russia put boots on the ground, I suppose you could say, in Ukraine. Uh, This was around the time that he recognized the independence of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic. Uh, at their request, it should be noted. And we were talking about why it's so important that Putin used the term accurately genocide to describe what's been happening to the people uh, of Donbass for the past eight years. So, Vanessa, do you want to pick up on that thread and sort of flesh that out as to why that's so important? Because I think it's a huge piece of the accurate narrative, if you will, that people, especially in the West, are either oblivious to or willfully ignoring. Important to note that in 2014, when, of course, uh, Victoria Newland was handing out cookies and um, the West and Israel, as I said, were sponsoring um, and backing the, the fascist coup. And I mean, I think I mentioned even Channel 4 were calling the, the rev- at the heart of the revolution um, was the right wing. Um, so, you know, there, there's never really been any kind of a denial of the fact that a, a democratic uh, president was overthrown by a right wing movement backed by, um, back to um, Oliver Stone's uh, movie, uh, Fire in Ukraine, which talks about the fact that the West had basically planned this for for decades, the weaponization of uh, fascist neo-Nazis, although someone pointed out to me the other day, well, they're not really neo-Nazis, they're just Nazis. Um, they, they, they've been Nazis forever. Um, they, there's, you know, they, they're not really kind of, I, I think we just tend to, to neo everything because we think it's all coming back again rather than it's always been there. Now it's just being triggered, right? Um, right. I mean, they, they and, essentially... Um, and I think... I was just going to say they essentially consider themselves the um, successors of people like Stepan Bandera, for example, yeah, who, exactly. who directly collaborated with the Nazis during World War II to carry out mm. mass atrocities against Jews, especially mm. in the Ukraine. Mm. Uh, they cite him often as a hero, uh, not just their hero, but the nationalist yeah. hero of Ukraine. And there are other mm-hmm. figures as well, too. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I think I think the neo is unnecessary. They are Nazis. They're, and that's why, Putin, Nazis, that's why Putin that's why Putin has used the, the term denazification in addition to yeah. demilitarization. And, and- you know, if, if, if we remember, actually, Russia suffered probably um, the most at the hands of the Nazis. So it has 
every rationale to say, I don't want a Nazi regime or, or a fascist regime on my doorstep, which of course, if, if NATO had its way and they were to nato -fy, um Ukraine, um, then there was high potential of an invasion by the Ukrainian forces into Donbass uh, and Lugansk, and that would have been a massacre. You know, that is to some extent why Putin, of course, organized the evacuation. Um, I don't, I don't know the final numbers, um, but it was, it was a huge number of people came into Rostov and were given temporary housing by Russia, so they were, they were settled um, for their mm -hmm. own safety even before um, the, the military action. You know, I tend to call it military action because it is literally military action. Um, and again, here we see parallels, of course. You see the hysteria in Western media talking about um, the, the Russian military action in Ukraine. And of course, what they're effectively doing is their utmost to avoid civilian casualties or even to avoid... Um, destruction of infrastructure in fact they destroyed i can't remember the name of the dam in a particular area of ukraine sorry I, my mind's gone blank um, but they destroyed a dam that had been depriving people of water and depriving agricultural farms and lands of water for for, for years so they actually destroyed it you know in order to yeah. enable the water to flow again etc um, and what they've been doing is taking out um, military installations and of course those are NATO installations, not mm -hmm. Ukrainian installations, because NATO has been pouring weapons and technology, uh, not only NATO, well, Turkey is NATO, um, into Ukraine again for years. And of course, now that's what they're doing. They're effectively saying, nah, we're not going to you know, come into military conflict with Russia, but they are through proxy which again is a parallel to, of course, what they did in Syria. They didn't commit their own um, armies on the ground in Syria. They weaponized the, the proxies, whether it was the Kurdish separatists, whether it's ISIS, Al-Qaeda, etc., cetera, um, to overthrow the, the government in Syria. And here, of course, what they're doing is, is flooding Ukraine, which it, with, as you said, mercenaries, and um, going back to um, the Israeli connection, what I was talking about was the fact that between the recognition of Donetsk and Lugansk and the military action, Israel targeted Damascus and uh, mm -hmm. the, close to the Golan, the, the illegally annexed Golan territory um, three times in one week, right? And, right? and the last one was on the actual day of the military action by Russia. So this was a clear indication of Israel's displeasure. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And of course, who gets targeted? Syria gets targeted. Um, and what did they take out? They took out, um, again, you know, uh, elements of the air defense systems. So we know that Israel is preparing itself for a potential escalation in conflict with Syria because each attack um, is is designed to damage Syria's capability to defend itself. Of course, it's not going to work because people keep banging on about where's Russia and where's the S-300s, but the, the very good reason Syria is not revealing where its S-300s are is because it knows at some point there's a very high potential for uh, an increase in conflict with Israel. And then you'll right. see, in my view, then you'll see the S three hundreds come into into use when Israel's not expecting them, because everyone, you know, everyone's kind of, I mean, they're helping in a way because they're putting out the storyline that, well, you know, what's happened? Russia's not supporting Syria, blah blah blah, and it, you know, that's another point to make. That you talk about the parallels between Syria and Russia. In my view, Ukraine throughout Russia's intervention in Syria legally at the behest of the elected Syrian uh, government and president. Um, ha the Ukraine has been used as a, as a bargaining chip against Russia by America, by the members of the US coalition. Now what has happened, and, and this is only part, I think, of, of Russia's um, reasons for going into Ukraine, Part of those
reasons is they were under pressure. They actually did was at that point to increase their military footprint in Syria. They've brought in um, planes that are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Um, they've brought six of their landing ships to the uh, coastal base, military base, ready for dispatch to the Black Sea and also to avoid, of course, the possible shutting down of the shipping lanes by Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and they've actually become more belligerent flying over the TANF base, the American base, illegal occupation base, um, the largest one in Syria. Uh, right. In the last two weeks, they've actually buzzed the base. Now, they haven't done that before now, right? Um, and I think now what's happened is, is effectively, you know, NATO has been poking the bear for so long. You know, they've reneged on every deal. They've refused to um, comply with the reassurances that Russia needed. I mean, they weren't unreasonable. <laughs> you know, right. Look, yeah, we, we don't haven't want even your gotten military into... on our borders. <laughs> right. We haven't even gotten into the Minsk agreement and the yeah. fact that Germany, which is reversed course and is now helping to flood Ukraine with weapons. Yeah. Germany and France were part of brokering the Minsk agreement between Russia and mm. Ukraine. And those two countries, Germany and France, had the obligation to make sure that the agreement was met, particularly by Ukraine. And mm -hmm. for eight years, they did nothing. And mm -hmm. part of the entreaties that Putin and Russia made to NATO before everything kicked off, so to speak, was asking for the Minsk agreement to be fulfilled uh, as was agreed to uh, back in 2015, I believe it was. And those were rebuffed. I, I believe Antony Blinken didn't even look at what was proposed. I think he just shrugged it off if, if whether he looked at it or not. And, um, you know, as Peter Ford wrote in a piece, which you published on your site, mm -hmm. the wall will fall .org, um, we poke the Russian bear and then we're surprised when it shows its claws. Yeah, exactly. You know, as, as I say, you know, if, if people actually flip it and think how America would react, I mean, you remember, I think it was in 2015, 2016, when Turkey brought down um, the Russian jets. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can imagine what the US reaction would be or the UK or the EU, right to something like that i mean i mean that was really an act of war and i remember how russia just basically uh, remained calm stoic mm -hmm. cold right and that's effectively what they've done you know throughout this throughout their involvement in syria throughout this entire ukraine crisis they have simply asked the West to comply with the necessary reassurances for them to feel that their national security was not under threat. And the West has effectively, you know, derided it, refused to even look at it, as you said, refused to offer any reassurances. And in my opinion, and this is only my personal opinion, but the Putin's reaction and the military action, it kind of caught me even off guard, to be honest. Um, yes, I agree. But I, I think what happened, because we had a very similar situation in Syria, in the liberation campaign in eastern Ghouta, the eastern suburbs of Damascus. Of course, that culminated in, as, as we talked about, the... Um, the fraudulent uh, Duma chemical attack in April mm -hmm. 2018, just as the final sector of those eastern suburbs was liberated by the Syrian army and, and allies. But in, 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 in Aleppo, for example, Russia, as far as Syria was concerned, was frustratingly diplomatic. In other words, as the Syrian army was advancing, suddenly the UN would demand a ceasefire, of course, everybody knew that the UN was demanding a ceasefire to give the armed groups time to regroup and to rearm and to prepare themselves mm -hmm. for the next 
um, wave of attacks from the Syrian Arab army. And there was a lot of frustration about the fact that, that Russia was, was kind of keeping to the diplomatic track, let's say, okay? In Ghouta, it was a very different story. Russia was like, okay, go ahead, you know, we're not stopping you, despite very similar hyperbole from the media. Again, we were told it was, you know, the Guernica, the last Guernica, et cetera, et cetera. We had yeah. all the same Sarajevo. You know, we had everything thrown in there to try and uh, pull a halt. But we found out um, during the last few uh, weeks of the campaign that actually America had been planning to reinforce the armed groups in Eastern Ghouta from um, the northeast and around Tanif, around the base on the border with Jordan, so slightly to the southeast of Damascus. And so Russia at that point had, had said, no, okay, you know, we can't risk this. Um, we have to secure the area. And in my view, I think they had intelligence, one, that there was a planned invasion of uh, the Donbass, which of course would have brought effectively NATO proxies to the doorstep of Russia. Right. And they would have lost the entire Donbass region, you know, potentially forever. Um, I think there was potential intelligence for strikes from within Western Ukraine. And of course, there was the fact that, that NATO was um, enabling Ukraine to develop its nuclear technology. There were also um, the bio labs <laughs> right. in Ukraine that had been developed in collaboration with the um, US Defense Department. And actually, uh, oh God, her second name's just gone from my head, Diliana Gaztieva, I think. A uh, Bulgarian journalist has written extensively about the um, the Pentagon biolabs, where, of course, they are developing pathogens, they're developing toxins, etc. You know, bioweapons. Um, right, and at and least Ukraine, the ones we know about, we're talking about yeah. dozens of them. Yeah, yeah, and Ukraine was one of the centers of this uh, research. She also has written extensively about um, the experiments carried out on, I uh, can't remember if it's US troops or Ukrainian troops. Um, but if you go to her website, Arms Watch, um, I think it's .org, uh, you'll find all of this research there. And, and you know, she has actually personally challenged members of uh, these uh, bioweapon labs uh, on their activities. Um, so she's, you know, probably one of the, the best journalists that's writing about this aspect of it. And she discovered the fact that um, the U.S. State Department had effectively wiped all the documents from their website pertaining to these bio labs. And um, there are reports, I mean, they're not confirmed that Russia has targeted these labs. Now, I would slightly question that because... I don't think Russia is stupid enough to do that because if, for example, they, they target a lab that's developing pathogens that are then released into the air, I, I, I honestly don't think Russia's likely to do that. What it might do is occupy them, take over them, as they kind of have done mm -hmm. with Chernobyl, of course. And that's now under um, Ukrainian uh, Russian guard. So right. that, that and, was and apparently... in collaboration. Mm. According to corporate media, when Russia occupied, uh, in part occupied Chernobyl, the radiation <laughs> levels supposedly increased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was just, I mean, you know, I'm literally begging people to try and engage brain on this one because it's too big. You know, we, yeah. I mean, we're so what does that mean? Russians are radioactive? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's really insane. And then, of course, what we're getting now is this blanket censorship. And, and so, so RT and Sputnik are right. basically banned, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're actually, for everyone to know, RT now have set up a, a channel on Odyssey. Um, God bless Odyssey. For now, it's refusing to get involved and it's saying it's apolitical and it's not going to ban anyone from its platform. Let's hope, let's hope they stay that way, right? Because we've right. seen in, in the COVID in the last two years, you know, as I said, 
how many um, dissenting voices have basically just been wiped out or demonetized or censored or deplatformed. And so now, yeah, I mean, this is absolutely. extraordinary. RT and Sputnik, I mean, come on. That's like banning BBC. <laughs> right. And BBC, you know? if anybody listening is familiar with ukcolumn.org, they've done some yeah. ex excellent co coverage Fantastic recently stuff. about yeah. how BBC has penetrated the Ukrainian media market to yeah. essentially set up entities, media entities to push the the war narrative, mm. the Ukrainian nationalist narrative, the mm -hmm. anti-Russia narrative. And uh, again, this is state funded uh, British media that we're talking about yeah. and uh, the hypocrisy of banning RT and Sputnik <laughs> because they're Russian state media. Um, it's, it's insane. I mean, it's it really, defies words. it's terrifying. I mean, this is another war, of course, you know, this entire shutting down of shipping, shutting down of airspace, um, kicking out of employees of, of uh, EU uh, institutions and, and corporations. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is just extraordinary. Uh, and you talk about the BBC infiltrating um, and, and setting up media institutions to foment the, the Russia phobia in Ukraine, which of course will have um, an Israeli handprint on it also, because BBC and Israel, you know, really do work hand in hand. I mean, we always used to laugh about Mark Rejev being um, the editor in chief of the BBC. Um, mm -hmm. But the BBC did exactly the same in Syria in 2004. BBC Media Action, um, Juliet Harkin, came to Syria and she effectively established, she was, she was scouting. So she was figuring out who the uh, Syrian opposition were, viable opposition for the West. Uh, and she was establishing opposition media outlets that then effectively um, took over in 2011 and started pumping out uh, anti-government slogans, anti-government propaganda, etc. Right. You, the, right. This is what the BBC do. I mean, they are the scout agency for um, MI6. And of course, right. the, the UK Foreign Office leaked documents which demonstrate that the BBC was involved in the entire media complex that was running um, media campaigns, PR campaigns for the armed groups, which include all the Al Qaeda affiliates. So basically for terrorism. So they've gone from uh, extremism and terrorism to neo-Nazis and, and fascists. And that's effectively what people are going to go and fight for. <laughs> right. Well, unfortunately, I absolutely agree with you. And unfortunately, we are out of time, so I have to leave it there. <laughs> but uh, okay. I thank you very much, Vanessa, for uh, taking the time to speak with me. I think we mined a lot of fertile ground and um, mm. there's a lot more we could talk about and I hope we can in the near future. But uh, thank you very much again. All right, you're welcome, Jesse, and good luck with the show. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.